Visitors to the farm love the thrill of panning for real gold, but very few have any idea what the inside of a real gold mine looks like. So the Knott family rolled up their collective sleeves and went to work again. In 1947, Walter Knott and his family renamed their roadside attraction from Knott's Berry Place to Knott's Berry Farm and Ghost Town. Continuing to cultivate his version of the Old West, Knott tasked artist Paul von Kleeburn to create a realistic gold mine. The Ghost Town gold mine opened mere steps away from Mrs. Knott's chicken dinner restaurant and the Ghost Town Village entrance. The walkthrough attraction offered guests the opportunity to venture into the tunnel of a gold strike and encounter ominous mine shafts, retreats, and the hypnotic mineral vein. The mine tunnel exited into a man-made ravine featuring the park's signature attraction, Panning for Real Gold. For a fee, guests received a pan and a prospector teaches them how to extract gold dust. Guests take their gold home in a souvenir glass vial. Walter Knott personally purchased the gold dust and prepped the sluice himself. The Ghost Town Gold Mine was one more mining method on display at Walter's growing Boomtown a passion project inspired by his family's pioneering history and his own experience working in the Silver King Mine at the real town of Calico. That same year, just 20 miles up the road in El Monte, Wendell Hurlbert was enjoying success with a humble roadside attraction of his own. Known to everyone as Bud, Hurlbert had been operating a small ride at a kiddie land in the parking lot of Crawford's village since 1945. The son of a machinist and engineer, Bud grew up around the tools of the oil industry. After graduating from Whittier High School in 1935, he apprenticed as a pattern maker at Volte Aircraft, where he created molds and forms for metal casting. The Volte plant, Downey, California. The plane in the making moves from one process to another. Bud learned to design and fabricate all sorts of parts, a rarity among engineers at the time. In the early 40s, one of Bud's friends sold their restaurant so they could operate a children's pony ride. The venture was lucrative, and Bud's interest in the amusement business flipped from curiosity to resolution. He decided to go into business for himself, designing, building, and selling his own attractions. Bud's first ride would become his signature. Over the years, Bud created patterns for full-size locomotives. He took his designs and experimented with scale and soon began building a rideable miniature train. Starting in 1943, the Hulber Amusement Company sold miniature trains to carnivals, amusement centers, private individuals, and even an airport. Over his lifetime, Bud would sell dozens of miniature trains, each prized for their high-quality construction and beautiful design. With the profits from the trains, Bud prepared to open the Kiddie Land in El Monte. He needed rides. So from an old machine shop in Whittier, Bud cranked out a pint-sized Ferris wheel, a small car ride, tiny boats that traveled in a trough, and more. He installed one of his trains, and with things going well, he made plans for the future. By the early 50s, Bud had purchased a historic 1896 Denzel merry-go-round from Hershey Park with plans to restore and sell the vintage carousel. Looking for a buyer, he thought of Walter Knott. Bud went to school with Knott's daughters and kept in touch with the family as their berry place grew and prospered. Bud thought his rides were a good match and offered to sell Walter a miniature train and even operate the merry-go-round as a concessionaire. But the old farmer wasn't interested. Walter Knott believed that iron rides would compromise his vision of a proper and authentic ghost town. Bud took no for an answer and moved on. Always evolving and growing, Bud eventually wanted more than just a corner of a parking lot. He purchased 33 acres of land in his hometown of Whittier and developed plans for an amusement park of his own. In 1955, having just laid the foundation for the Denzel merry-go-round, Bud received a visit from Russell Knott, Walter Knott's son. Local competition was heating up, and Walter didn't want the farm to become obsolete. After guest surveys revealed that additional amusement offerings were desired, the old farmer reconsidered Bud's offer. Walter wanted Bud to operate the vintage carousel at Knott's Berry Farm. As concessionaire, Hulbert would assume the cost for construction, installation, operation, and rent. Hulbert would also have to pay a cut of the proceeds to Knott's. Bud was keen and highly motivated, but had one hang-up. The one thing rule. Walter Knott had a rule that concessionaires could only have one concession at his farm and no more. No exception had been granted, and there was no reason to believe the policy could be changed. 
Willing to risk it, Bud met with Walter and pled his case. Mr. Not, he said, I couldn't do just the one thing. No matter how good it is, I can't limit the opportunities of what I want to do. The old farmer agreed to bend, slightly. Walter would let Bud pitch new ride ideas in the future, but first the upstart from Whittier would have to prove himself. If Bud did a good job running the carousel, Walter promised to break the one thing rule. Bud accepted and the show men were officially in business. No lawyers, no paperwork, just a handshake. Bud's merry-go-round opened in 1955 in the eastern corner of the property and was an instant success. Attendance at the farm grew from the previous year and Bud got to work on a design for his second concession, merry-go-round auto ride. Knott's Berry Farm already had two car rides, so Bud's approach had to be notably different. He turned to Arrow Development for help with the ride system so he could focus on the attraction's look, feel and experience. Bud's vision was an idyllic leisure ride over hilly bluffs, past miniature buildings, through dark tunnels, around glistening water features and across a soaring bridge. His second ride opened in 1958 and again, Bud had a hit. Guests especially loved the track's meandering layout around the area's trees, a feature Bud credited to the stringent requirements of his tree-loving landlord. One year later, Bud installed one of his trains on circuit around Knot Six Acre Lagoon, an unprecedented third concession. Every time the former pattern maker proved himself, the old farmer kept his promise. Knott and Hilbert had achieved moderate success with a trio of humble and quaint rides. Neither man could have known that the fourth act would become the most consequential attraction in Knott's Berry Farm history. Bud was on a roll. Walter was not. Back in 1950, Knott's welcomed the Mark Smith Horse Show into a 3,000 seat stadium, purpose built for the equestrian extravaganza. This is the range country, where the pounding hooves of untamed horses still thunder over mountains, meadows and canyons. Every herd has its own leader, but there was only one Fury. Fury, king of the wild stallions. Unfortunately, in only five years, public interest had collapsed. The famous trainer called it quits and left the farm's largest single structure without a paying tenant. Walter needed a replacement as quickly as possible, so he brought in animal psychologists Marion and Keller Brayland. They opened the Bewitched Village in 1956, an odd combination of animal tricks and sideshow buffoonery. Audiences didn't bite. Though special events would occasionally be held there, ultimately the arena sat unused until 1959 when Walter finally turned to Bud. On a typical walk around the park, Walter asked Bud if he had any ideas for what could be put into the stadium. Surprisingly, Bud said no, but promised to come up with something. Not wasn't messing around and told the ambitious concessionaire that this was his chance to have the best piece of land left on the farm, so it's got to be something that makes money. The pressure was on and Bud felt it. He needed more than just another amusement. He needed a showstopper. He believed that it should pertain to mining somehow. A fitting choice given the attraction's visibility from the Ghost Town Railroad and the Calico Saloon. But this mine had to be bigger and more elaborate than anything else on the farm. And because it was going to be a Holbert Company venture, it needed to be a fully fledged ride. Bud's first concept was a mine-themed ghost train. Guests would board ore cars and travel through mine tunnels to learn about the real methods, conditions, and history of hard rock mining. The initial idea was a one-level electric track with small two-person vehicles, a basic dark ride. Unhappy with the low capacity, he ditched the two-person cars and considered increasing the vehicle size. He looked at several sizes, but in the end realized that capacity would always be limited due to the constraints of an electric track. Then it hit him he could use his signature ride system, the miniature train. Bud's train increased capacity to 50 riders per ride. Instead of the regular engines which ran on petrol, he sourced battery-powered donkey engines from General Electric. To make the modern locomotives fit the story of an 1880s mining company, Bud built decorative shells to cover the battery and motor. Each of the six engines is unique in shape and colouring. Bud's father, Ray, helped build the trains along with longtime colleague and former Kiddieland competitor, Harry Suka. As the ride vehicles grew in size, so did the track layout and show scenes. The ride's track increased from one level to three. In addition to mine tunnels, guests would discover stopes, subterranean water features, and a massive central show scene with animated characters and activity in every possible direction. 
The final design of the Calico Mime is a seven story tall mountain covered in rockwork, fauna, buildings and waterfalls, punctured by mine tunnels and a railroad careening inside and out. Construction of the Calico Mime Rye began in the fall of 1959. The show building required 275 tons of reinforced and structural steel. Rebar and chicken wire were laid atop the internal framework and then gunite was sprayed to fill out the facade. The endeavor burned cash quickly and Bud found himself stuck between a rock and, well, you know. He sold his ranch, his home and his brand new Cadillac. Bud and his wife Lou moved into a trailer on the farm and slept in cots to save money, but even that was not enough to temper the high cost of construction. For the first time since their handshake, Bud wasn't quite holding up his end of the bargain. Nevertheless, he went to his landlord for help. Concerned, Walter wanted assurance and asked the concessionaire point blank if he knew what he was doing. Immediately, Bud said yes. Satisfied, not offered to defer rent payments so that building could go on uninterrupted. He also offered to fund a promotional film to advertise the new attraction. Bud took the deal and went back to it. Later in life, Bud would reflect on this conversation as the only time he ever lied to the old farmer. Revived and relieved, Bud saw the effort through, personally laying each piece of rail. On the 22nd of November 1960, after a year of construction and at a cost of $1.5 million, the Calico Mine Ride opened to the public. Riders purchased tickets from a fiend booth outside the entrance to the attraction. Adults paid 50 cents and children 35. Legend has it that Walt Disney, a friend of Bud since the 40s, watched the construction of the Calico Mime Ride with great interest. On his first visit to ride the attraction, Walt was in a rush and didn't want to wait in a long line. Bud pointed to the entrance by the ticket booth and without a single guest in sight, Disney expected to walk right up to the loading station. His fast pass hopes were dashed though, after passing around the ticket booth, Walt found 200 customers waiting in front of him lined up in a series of switchbacks tucked behind the ticket booth, under the ride track and weaving around the rockwork facade. Bud had created the world's first hidden queue, frustrating and impressing his visitor. This innovation had become standard across the theme park industry and is a staple of Disney parks. After riders board into an ore cart, they receive a safety spill and enter the first tunnel. Remember the men who dig tunnels like this were following a vein of gold so when the vein turned, the tunnel turned also. This cavern-like room formed by Mother Nature is alive with steam pressures. Huge mud pots, each in a different color, belch bubbles of live steam. Walter Knott revealed authenticity, a value that Bud also shared. To make the Calico Mine Ride as real as possible, Herbert drove to Yellowstone to study the famous mud pots in person. This is the very heart of the mine. It's called the Glory Hole. Bud spent time with actual mining companies to observe hard rock mining firsthand. Along his travels, he bought genuine tools and equipment to decorate show scenes, including pickaxes, conveyance elements, and much more. From the floor of the Glory Hole, miners pursued that magic yellow mineral up and across in almost every direction. After leaving the main ride scene, riders pass by an underground lake and roaring waterfall. The attraction pumps 3 million gallons of water every day. The Calico Mime Ride is meant to be fun and educational. On that second point, one particular scene couldn't be more blunt. As our train rounds a curve, we arrive at the bottom of the mine. Supposedly, we are now at the 3,000 foot level. 3,000 feet would be impossible without these square timbers. This is an accurate reproduction of square set timbering as invented by Philip Dedesheimer. In 1860, Dedesheimer perfected square set timbering to eliminate cave-ins. And even though he was laughed at and scoffed at in the beginning, ridicule turned to glowing praise and he was eventually known as the savior of the Comstock. The next bit of track takes riders up a lift hill to the top level of the attraction. But this lift hill is more than it seems. The climb is 160 feet long at a pitch of 25 degrees, a rise so intense that no engineer would take on the job of creating the lift mechanism for fear of failure. With no other choice, Bud took on the challenge. What he came up with was simple, yet revolutionary. Rather than position the train's motor at the base of the hill, the convention for amusement engineers at the time, Bud placed the motor at the top, allowing the drive system to pull the trains up rather than push. 
The design worked so well that the original lift chain lasted for 27 years before needing a replacement. Having braved the daring incline, riders are awarded at the top of the lift with something magical and unexpected. It hasn't happened very often, but it is possible for miners tunneling their shaft into a mountain to break through a wall unexpectedly and find themselves standing in an immense cavern. Like this. Walter Knott didn't believe that such caverns actually existed and made his doubts known. Thankfully, Bud was friends with Jim White, the man who discovered Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico and referred to White's discovery of proof of accuracy. This heavenly experience is enhanced by the recording of silent film organist Gaylord Carter, who improvised the soundtrack in one session. In this ageless cavern, time seems to stand still, but our train doesn't, so we continue on. The ride's mind system relies on gravity to move from level to level. Drivers control the train's speed with a brake. The use of momentum as a means of propulsion is why some believe Calico Mine Ride to be the farm's first roller coaster. As the train passes by an authentic winds device, riders get their second view of the glory hole, this time from the top level. The glory hole measures 90 feet diameter and 65 feet tall. The track heads outside and riders get a bird's eye view of Calico Square before returning back into the rocky confines. Again we pass the glory hole, this time from the middle level, and this view gives us a completely different perspective of the immense pit. Um, sure. En route to the final scene, riders see that the danger sign is illuminated. The train enters into a blasting area and it's too late. Explosions surround the train. The beams above snap and the rocky ceiling comes crashing down. To get a real explosion sound effect, Bud and his team traveled to the desert near Barstow and detonated actual dynamite. To add a sense of urgency, the driver releases the brake so the train can pick up speed. Riders escape the final tunnel and find themselves back outside at the unload station. In 2014, Ghana Holt Productions was hired to give the Calico Mine Ride its biggest renovation and upgrade since opening. I used to ride this ride with my dad as a child. I remember thinking it was a real mine. I didn't. I thought it was. I was really going underground, and I was really afraid. I think you could take this and lift it out of this park and put it in almost any park and it would be a great attraction. It is way ahead of its time. It's well thought out. It's an immersive environment. It's something people really enjoy. And, uh, you know, it stands the test of time. In addition to restoring existing scenes, select characters and features were either added or enhanced, including the always mentioned but non-existent Blind Fish, a new animatronic to welcome riders into the first tunnel, and for better or worse, the attraction switched from a live spill to a pre-recorded narration. I'm gonna hand all the talking down to one of my dearest minor friends to tell you more about the Calico Mines. Howdy folks, this here is old Polecat Mahoney, and I am delighted to take you into the famous Calico Mine, the richest gold strike this side of the Mississippi. The Calico Mine ride was an instant hit with guests. In eight months, the ride sold over a million tickets, and less than two years Bud counted a profit. The mountain's Herculean scale dominated the horizon of Calico Square, establishing a backdrop that had never existed before and beckon guests to venture as far into the expanse of the ghost town as their boots could take them. After the mine ride's success, Bud added more concessions around the lagoon, including another historic carousel, as well as a paddle boat steamer named in honor of the woman whose chicken dinners made all of this possible. In 1966, Bud fashioned an exact replica of America's Liberty Bell for Walter Knott's recreation of Philadelphia's Independence Hall. In 1969, Bud would partner with Arrow Development once more to create the world's first theme log ride, but that's a tale for another expedition. At Halloween Haunt in 1973, the first ever Not Scary Farm event, Bud dressed up in a gorilla costume and spooked mine riders inside the Blacklit Cavern. In time, Bud's attention moved away from the farm. In 1976, he opened Castle Park in Riverside, realizing his lifelong dream of a park of his own. Among the many rides at Castle Park, guests will find one of Bud's prized miniature trains, still in operation and as beloved as ever. The original Ghost Town Goldmine closed in 1998 to become the entrance for Ghost Rider, 
The Panning for Gold attraction is still available though and recently moved back to the same ravine dug by the old farmer long ago. The Holbert Amusement Company owned and operated concessions at Knott's Berry Farm until 1983, when Bud finally sold his collection of rides to the park. Bud never strayed far from his masterworks though and tinkered in his Buena Park workshop until his passing in 2011. The Calico Mime Ride captured new attention from audiences and the growing theme park industry. Never before had a Knott's Ride been built with immersive theming, forward-looking technology and multi-layered narrative on a grand scale. The use of animatronics and special effects raised the bar for future attractions and established Knott's Berry Farm as a destination for thrills. Most importantly, the Calico Mine's focus on authenticity reinforced Ghost Town's reason for being and burnished the hard-earned reputation of the growing amusement park as both a family-friendly wonderland and a faithful recreation of the Old West. While Bud's Mine Ride propelled the farm's attractions to new heights of excitement, it would be the vision of another old-time adventurer that would transform Knott's Berry Farm into the modern theme park we know today. Thank you so much for joining us on our first look at Knott's Berry Farm. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to join the expedition. A special thank you to Chris Jepson and Steve Offerly of the Orange County Archives for their assistance with research, images, and footage for this episode. Also, as always, a special thank you to our patrons for supporting the channel. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates on upcoming expeditions, and we will see you next time. They started with a berry stand, and they became the family that built a mountain.